Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to IPA's good signature event of Canadian Music Week 2012. My name is Professor Giuseppina D'Agostino and I'm the founder and director of IP Osgood, Osgood's IP and tech program. Now, as many of you might know, IP Osgood's mission is really to inject many more voices to the IP debate and enhance the learning opportunities for our students. And today's is no exception. And if you haven't already done so, I do encourage you to check out our website, iposgood.ca. So it's just flashed up above me. And if uh, there'll be a bonus question, but there's actually a mashup up there. So that's something for you to figure out. Um, next week, what you should be mindful of is that we're actually recording today's session. So there'll be a link on the website and you'll be able to flip it to any of your friends or anyone that wasn't able to make it tonight. Also, Kaylin Lumsden, one of our IPLOG editors, is going to be blogging about the event, and we're going to be posting that as well. So events like these are really not possible with a host of many uh, different people coming together to uh, pull up their sleeves. And here, my first thanks really goes to Professor Barry Sukman for allowing us to take uh, over his IP class. Also, many thanks to the Hennig Center of Business and Law here at Osgood in Schulich. Thanks to the logistical team at Osgood, uh, and here from Mary Barbieri to Mark Bauman to Benjamin Farrell to Mark Koras, who've really uh, done an immense job, to the leaders of Canadian Music Week for allowing our speakers to be here tonight, and to our sponsors. And here we have five founding law, law firm sponsors. So Castles, Gowlings, McCarthy's, Norton Rose, Oslers, as well as two industry sponsors, the Audiovisual Licensing Agency and the Canadian Copyright Collective. So just a quick word, I don't know if you've noticed, but when you came in, there was um, a raffle. So those are our door prizes. So what I do encourage you to do is to make sure you don't leave here without filling out um, that little piece of paper and putting your information down because that will allow you to be um, one of the winners. There's 20 books that we're giving out of uh, Robert Levine's book. So we'll be in touch with you uh, next week if you're one of the winners. So fill out your contact info and that also will um, enable you to receive the Ipigram, which is our weekly newsletter. So the newsletter is really a recap of all that goes on on IP Osgood throughout um, the week's activities. So at this point, I'm really proud to introduce our honored speakers, and I have to say that they are really busy. Canadian Music Week it has a flurry of events, and they're being torn in every in which direction. They're actually on duty again early tomorrow morning. After this, they're going to some other events. Um, and I don't think we're being fair on them because they don't get to enjoy this amazing weather. So uh, hopefully you'll be back next time. Um, you've seen their impressive bios and here Robert Levine, he was recently the executive editor of Billboard as well as being an editor and writer for a slew of different magazines and leading publications uh, on and on. Um, he did ask for whoever introduced him to make sure they said one disclaimer, and here I'd like to quote him directly, if I might. Um, and this is in his words. I'm not a lawyer, much less a Canadian one. I do OK, but I'm really a business journalist. So it's hard for me to get into the weeds on, say, C11. So here, you know what? I appreciate that, because we are in the weeds on C11, and enough on C11, no questions on C11, but of course, <laughs> He's very much um, knowledgeable on the bigger picture of the music industry, copyright infringement, and he's done this in his book, Free Ride. So just to quote from uh, the flap of his book here, um, Free Ride offers a breakthrough understanding of how the publishing, music, and film industries went from raking in big bucks to taking in digital dimes and presents fresh ideas that could reverse the tide. It is a clarion call, I like that, for the culture business to seize control of its destiny. 
So we'll hear more from Robert shortly. We have, of course, Brett Danaher with us. He's a professor of economics at Wellesley College. And he's going to be drawing from his recent work on one aspect, which is something that has actually been at play in much scholarship, and that's the three strikes law, graduated response. And he's going to focus on France. And he has a lot of data that he's collected, and he's going to be reporting on that. And he's written this work. And I'd like to just quote from the first line of his paper that I have with me. Since the rise of Napster, piracy killed the radio star could be the global slogan of the music industry. So with that, you have two provocative perspectives on issues that are really plaguing the music industry and that really intimately affect all of us, either as students, users, consumers, educators, whatever you call it. But it's something that affects our daily lives. So I do encourage all of you who have a vested interest in these issues to comment, inject your views, and ask questions. In fact, we'll have 30 minutes of questions. So first, we'll hear from Robert Levine, then Brett Danaher, so 25 minutes each. And then we'll have Professor Sukman moderate the discussion. So with that, I introduce our honored speakers. Thank you. What I was going to say about um, the disclaimer is I, there's an old, to misquote an old commercial, I'm not a lawyer, but I play one on TV. I've been running around talking about the book. I think that's probably an age reference. Um, when I talk about the book, people usually ask me why I wrote it. And it has a lot to do with my own curiosity as a journalist, which led me to find out a lot about, well, a little about law. It feels like a lot, except when I'm at a law school. And these different kinds of technology issues. And the, the reason was that it sort of follows my own path in terms of how I thought about this. When Napster came out in 1999, and you have to pause, cast your mind back, you still had a VCR. A lot of people were still up on, on dial-up. It was a different world. I thought Napster was the greatest thing ever. If you think about the internet back to in 1999, in the 90s, as people, as Al Gore envisioned it when he invented it, as I like to joke, it, people, one of the things it was going to do is going to establish a market for intellectual property. A lot of it was going to be created in the U.S. and North America and the countries of the West. And as we lost manufacturing jobs, we were going to replace them with creative jobs. And it would allow independent artists to compete at an, on an even playing field with big media companies. You could decide if you wanted a, a label deal, what kind of label deal you wanted. Labels would have to compete for you, there would be a, a market for intellectual property. And I thought Napster was a disruptive sign, but that a market would slowly emerge after we found some way to legalize that. And what I found as the years went by, and I was covering this intermittently, was that piracy had become such a big problem that a legitimate market never really emerged. And there's a lot of argument about what the effect of piracy has been on the music business. There are papers that will tell you it has practically destroyed it. There are some people who will tell you piracy has helped the music business. Um, they're using some pretty funny math. To cite one example, um, there's one paper that says the overall size of the music business has increased, but they're counting iPod sales as music sales. And as I say in the book, this is sort of like counting custom closet installations as part of the fashion business. You don't see any of that money. It, it's not of great comfort to musicians. Um, so the effect of piracy, really, to me, is that it stopped a market, for, it stopped an orderly market from emerging. It's not only what people are downloading instead of buying. It's also the price setting power that Apple and Amazon and Google now have. Because of the way some of the laws work, if it's online, you have to request them to take it down again and again and again and again, and I'll explain a bit more about that, or you accept their offer. It's a very tough way to negotiate. It's like starting a job, signing a contract, and then figuring out what your salary is going to be. I like to do it in the other order. And one of the things that you really see here is there's been a story we tell each other about how this issue looks. And we, we've seen it as a case of big companies versus human rights. Old companies versus new companies, dumb companies versus smart companies, greedy companies versus generous companies. 
And the problem with that story is, although a lot of those data points are right, I question the conclusions that it's led us to, and I think the story is really not the best way to understand this, because if you think about it, whether a company is old or new doesn't make much of a difference. There's only one business model, selling something for more than it costs you to make it. Everything else is sort of an illusion. Someone told me, I make a lot of money by giving stuff away. And I said, no, you don't. You make money by selling other things. Giving stuff away is marketing. It could be great marketing, but that's not how you're making money. When it comes to dumb versus smart, there's been plenty of bad decisions on the part of old media companies. But if you look at Silicon Valley, venture capitalists, you might have one big success out of 10 companies you invest in. That's a great business model, but they're certainly not always doing the right thing. And I haven't checked my Groupon stock lately. I'm kidding. I don't own any, but I'm not sure. I don't think it's going up. As far as greedy versus generous, you know, you hear a lot about record company greed, and I think people in the record companies, people in the music business like to make money. But I'm pretty sure that Silicon Valley venture capitalists also like to make money. Just a rumor. And for that matter, I sold my book to the highest bidder. I'm not exceptionally motivated by money, or I wouldn't have become a writer in the first place. However, once I did, I, I, once, I told my students when I was teaching writing, you've already made the dumbest financial mistake you can ever make if you became a journalist. Make sure that your other decisions are good. Um, I just said as an example, one of the things that solidified this story happened when, um, when Napster was really going, and you saw Metallica sue Napster. And you had Lars Ulrich, the drummer of Metallica, arrive at Napster headquarters in a chauffeur-driven SUV with his lawyer and a bunch of guys to carry 36 file boxes full of infringers that they had identified on Napster. And he gave a press conference in the parking lot of Napster. And it couldn't have looked any worse. Here you have this big, rich rock star who doesn't understand the internet. And then you have this college kid who found that Napster is so dynamic. And Lars Ulrich looked silly. But let's look at what was really happening, because Lars Ulrich said something that is very smart, and I think by the standards of rock drummers, extraordinarily so, if I may say. He said, quote, they're looking at the business like one day there will be a major IPO or an AOL-type company is going to come and buy Napster out for a gazillion dollars. As a matter of fact, a month later, they had a big venture capital investment. And at that time, even before they got the venture capital investment, Sean Fanning's uncle had taken 70% of the company, leaving Sean, who invented it, with 30%. Now, I, I'm covered the music industry enough to know that, that you know, accounting can often resemble black magic more than mathematics, but a few of the record companies rip off their own, their own relatives. And yet, all you heard from Napster is, you're ripping people off. This is a more honest way of doing business from a guy who had a very interesting split with his nephew. So there's old and new on both sides, dumb and smart on both sides, greedy and generous on both sides. And the point is that you also have, it's not big companies versus rights. It's really big companies versus big companies and rights versus rights. Google, I'm going to call it a big company. I don't know where the line is. Bear with me. It's a big company. Apple's a big company. Amazon's a big company. These are huge companies. Record companies are not as big as they were. You could say that's good or you could say that's bad. But the idea that the technology business is always the underdog strikes me as outdated, if not completely silly. Now let's look at rights. What you hear about, you always hear about copyright is that it represents a conflict for free speech. It stands in the way of free speech. It stands in the way of property right or some other right. Certainly, there's potential for it to do that. But the idea that copyright intrinsically conflicts with free speech is very hard to find in US law. Canadian law, as I said, you'll have to, uh, what did I say, Fair, bear with me, excuse me, I forget my words. But I, I don't know of anything in Canadian law either. There's a famous quote by just, um, Sandra Day O'Connor, Supreme Court Justice, who said that the framers intended copyright itself to be the engine of free expression that by giving you an incentive to create, it aided free expression. It didn't stop it. And one of the blogs who reviewed, bloggers who reviewed my 
reviewed my book, I'd call it more of a drive-by than a review, but that's a whole other story, said that this is crazy because clearly copyright stands in the way of saying what you want to say. And I said, yeah, but ask Sandra Day O'Connor, it's her quote. My point isn't who's right or who's wrong, but the law has always recognized rights on both sides. The other thing that's interesting is, that Sandra Day O'Connor quote is from the, I forget the exact, it was the Nation versus, I forget, it was a case about Gerald Ford's memoirs. These issues go back. So, years and years ago, hundreds of years ago, people were talking about greedy authors, greedy publishers, people who were distributing those works without compensating writers, much like some people do today. We're saying, you want too much money. It's in the interest of society to have cheap books. So people like Victor Hugo and Charles Dickens spoke up against this. They were, in a way, the Metallicas of their day. And I don't know, maybe there's no real point to that. I just like using Victor Hugo and Charles Dickens and Metallica in the same sentence, because it's, it's kind of fun. Um, there are rights on both sides. Copyright can stop free speech. It can help free speech. You know, people say copyright is a property right, and so people say it's not a property right. I think you can look at it in different ways. What's interesting is that a copyright, the debate around it, at least in public, maybe not in law, has really become increasingly unmoored from reality. So you have people on the right saying, property is property except intellectual property. Only something you can hold in your hand is property. Now, there's a whole sort of economics behind this. I'll skip some of it, but let's say, okay, your house is property. But what affects the value of your house? What school district you're in? What you can build next to that house? Law has a large effect on all kinds of property. My car was recently deemed unroadworthy. Now it's not worth so much. It's physical property, but the law impacts it a great deal. I, the IP regime we have is totally consistent with that. And so you have conservatives who are against property, they're against markets. Seems weird for conservatives. On, the, on progressives, you have an even weirder situation. I was on public radio in the US, and they asked me, so do you really think the government should be regulating the internet? I said, wait a minute. Aren't you on the left? I said, yeah. I said, don't you want government regulation? Isn't that the whole point of being progressive, is that you want the government to ensure a more just market? And I think there are some ways copyright does that. Co copyright gives me the right to sell my book. If, and it, as I say, it's available, I think this is the third time I've said this today, I feel a little silly. It's available in three ways, in hardback, on the Kindle, and on a pirate website from Brazil. The first, that third one, I would say, there's a labor rights issue there. You can look at it different ways, but my rights are being violated. I'm not getting compensated. What's interesting is that on the left, the same people who hate Walmart for underpaying workers don't see a problem with that Brazilian site not paying me at all. And you might say, well, yeah, but there's all these big companies, that's why the left is coming to be against copyright. Again, there's big companies on both sides. The other thing is, when people are critical of copyright, a lot of the points they make are interesting, but they have very, not, they have very little to do with copyright. So let's look at a headline from last week. The Temptations are suing Universal for not paying them proper royalties. And they went through in their, uh, in their filing a list of horrible things Universal had done, allegedly. I don't know the truth of it. They said, we want to be compensated. We want, to, we want this fixed. And to the extent, if what they say is true, and I don't know that it is, that's not a copyright program so much as a contract problem. So let's look at what copyright does here. Copyright gives the temptations a right, gives them something to sell. They entered into a contract with Universal. Was it a good idea to enter that contract? We don't know. The contract didn't work out the way they wanted. Now they're suing Universal. Isn't that what we all want? I don't mean we want to sue each other, but we want the ability to enter into contracts 
those contracts don't turn out the way we want, we want to go to court and get a fair hearing. This is exactly what we want, and I hope whoever's right wins in court. Obviously, there are issues with, well, sometimes whoever hires the best lawyer wins in court. Again, that's not an issue with copyright. It's an issue about our legal system. There's plenty of things I'm not thrilled with with our, our legal system, but that's a whole other, whole other issue. I use myself as another example. Someone said, well, I wouldn't take your book from you, but I'm not taking it from you, I'm taking it from Random House. And I said, what's the difference? And what they meant, I assume, is I seem like a sympathetic guy. At the time, I was less jet lagged, so it was probably a little funnier. And Random House isn't sympathetic, it's a big impersonal company. I get that. I don't have a warm, cuddly feeling about Random House myself. But what is the legal implication of having or not having a warm, cuddly feeling about a company? It's just absurd. I have a right to my work. You can view it as an economic right, a human right, property right, whatever you want. I could deal with that in any number of ways. I could sell it myself, print it myself, license it. I chose to license it to Random House. Now, my royalty for each book is about $4. Some people hear that and they're outraged. Where does the rest of the money go? Does Random House keep it all? And people who think the book publishers are making a lot of money, do you guys know anyone in the book business? It's not a get-rich-quick scheme. Not a lot of money goes to printing the book. A lot of the money goes to risk. Say one out of every eight books makes money. If I chose to write a book, if I was confronted with that on my own, okay, I could write a book. There's a one in eight chance that I make money. What's the upside? I make a living for a couple years. What's the downside? I don't feed my family. Doesn't sound that good to me. Let's look at Random House. One out of eight books makes money. Some might not do well. They're going to make it up on hits, just like venture capitalists do. What they do, more than distribute, more than promote, more than print, is they aggregate risk in a way that writers can't. I think that's very important. Some people like it, some people don't. I found that agreement to be in my interest. I read the contract, I signed the contract. People have a tendency to look at artists like delicate flowers. Oh my God, Random House is taking advantage of you. I'm an adult, I read the contract, I chose that deal. Was it the right decision? I think so. If it hadn't been the right decision, could I have blamed it on copyright law? I don't see how. I'm gonna, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna start to finish. You hear a lot of things about, the other, I think, big complaint about copyright law is that it sort of somehow suffocates creativity and I started thinking about copyright in three dimensions. This is not a recognized academic theory. It's just something I made up one day, so pardon me. I think about it in length, breadth, and depth. Length is how long it lasts. Breadth is what it covers. Depth, which it sort of falls apart here, I'm sorry, as I said, I made it up one day, is how seriously it's enforced. So if you were going to maximize creativity, what kind of copyright system would you have? I think you'd have a shorter length of term. I don't really need the rights to this book for 70 years after I die. I'd like to have it, but right now, that's not the biggest problem with copyright. The problem is, even before the book came out in the US, it was available on that pirate site in Brazil. So I didn't have a practical, enforceable copyright for 70 years after death. I had it for five minutes. That's not enough time. Somewhere between five minutes and 70 years after death, I'm not saying it has to be exactly mathematically in between, but somewhere within that I think would be good. Now let's look at breadth. Some people say, you know, originally should it cover a translation? Should it cover a movie version? Should it cover an excerpt for criticism? Well, I think we could, most people would agree. I have the right to sell, I should have the right to sell translations, I should have the right to sell movie rights. Probably a pretty boring movie, but hey, knock yourself out if you know anyone interested. If you want to excerpt my book, to criticize it, go ahead, that's great. But some people might be valuing the derivative work more than the original work. Someone on the, other side, on the other side of the issue said, what's really important about your book is the other art that will be made from it. And my reaction was, what? 
It's a book of nonfiction journalism. I think it's okay. Some people don't, whatever. You can read it, you make up your own mind. But this is not a great DJ set waiting to happen. Let me know if you think otherwise. If you want to make it a great DJ set, that's awesome. If you want to make it a movie with zombies, I'm really, you know, Pride and Prejudice did it, so why not? Go ahead, that's great. That's breath. Now let's look at depth. So if you want to copyright to encourage creativity to have a shorter length, and I think less breath, what we really need though is depth. We need to have some enforceability. I need to have a way of making sure that site in Brazil isn't distributing my book on an unauthorized basis. I don't want to go after the people who are downloading it. I think copyright law has always worked B2B, not B2C, if you'll pardon the jargon. But I don't want that site to be distributing it without my permission. I would like to have them keep distributing it, but pay me. That's another story. So I do think you need depth. And when people criticize copyright, a lot of times they're not against the law so much as enforcing it. Someone said, do you think, would you ever sue anybody for downloading your book illegal? And I said, no, but I want the right to do so. I can't imagine ever doing it. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's practical. Quite honestly, I'm not, an, as you know already, I'm not an attorney, and I think it's probably an expensive hobby to go around suing people if you're not. But the idea that I have the right to redress a wrong in court is a very important idea. I hope never to use it, but I think it's important to have that idea. And a lot of criticisms of copyright about how it's gone too long or it covers too much, I think are masquerading a desire to not enforce it at all. And I think that's something that, instead of fixing what's wrong with copyright, you're gonna undo what's right with copyright. And uh, that's, that's me. As I said, jet lag, I'm sorry. I don't think I can even address it. I'm a professor, so I don't think I can address a class without by sitting down. So I have to stand up. <laughs> um, it just feels unnatural for me. Um, so, uh, you know, to the degree that what we just heard was a sort of very um, big picture view about copyright, uh, I think that, that that kind of stuff is very interesting. And I read, I've read this book. I've read books on the other side. I've read Larry Lessig's books. I've read a lot of books about sort of copyright, intellectual property. Um, I'm going to approach things from a different angle because. One, I'm an economist, and we're kind of a strange breed as it is. Um, and second of all, because I'm a junior academic seeking tenure at Wellesley College. So to some degree, I have to be really careful right now. Right? Um, I don't see my job. You know, There are other people whose job it is to decide if laws are bad or good. You know, and I don't see that as my job, because it's not my expertise or my training. Right? So the question is, you know, what is it that I can offer? And what I would say is, one thing that economists are really good at is measurement and good at measuring things that other people aren't necessarily good at measuring. Good at being able to make statements and taking, you know, looking at correlation and being able to tease causation out of it. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. All right? But so that's what I'm here for today. So I'm going to sort of narrow things up a little bit. And I'm going to talk about a law in France called Hadopi, which was a graduated response law. And at the end of the day, I, I want to start out and then at the end of the day by saying that this paper isn't about whether this is a good law or a bad law. Because I don't think I'm qualified to tell you that. Okay? But I am qualified to tell you what the law says because I've done a lot of reading about it. And then I'm going to be able to answer one really important question that is often part of the center of the debate over the law. So that's what this presentation is going to be about. I should mention I have a couple of co-authors, uh, two co-authors at Carnegie Mellon and then one of my undergraduate students at Wellesley College. Where am I pointing? Right, okay. So uh, my PhD advisor actually said something. He, he also did some work on music file sharing. And he said something really, really neat one time. He said, every time an economist gives a talk on file sharing, it always has to start with a slide that motivates the issue by telling you that the sky is falling. All right, so first of all, here's my slide. And here's Chicken Little telling you that the sky is falling. But if I can back up, 
the motivation really is, and at least for the music industry, and we could talk about movies being a different, maybe a different picture or maybe not, but at least for the music industry, the music industry basically halved in size over the space of 10 years. And they do happen to be the 10 years right around after the, the founding in, of Napster. Okay? So there is something going on here. And for a while, there was this big debate. In fact, for the past 10 years, economists have had this sort of debate back and forth over how much of that decline is actually because of file sharing as opposed to all the other explanations you can come up, come up with. And of course, as academics, we like to get it right. We take a while. And economists are really good at teasing causation out of correlation. So we're trying to figure out what's the causal effect of file sharing on sales. And I can tell you that after 10 years, economists have finally decided that when people go out there and download stuff for free, that sales are going to go down. All right? So it only took 10 years to figure that out. Um, but you know, joking aside, what I would say is that you know, there are studies on both sides of the fence. But at least in the economics literature, whereas I think we're really good at this kind of measurement, all right, there's about 10 or 11 studies that are published in really good peer-reviewed journals. And all but one of them say that file sharing has depressed sales. And that, that one has sort of been like debated pretty heavily, and it was an earlier paper. All right? So it kind of, we've kind of come to this agreement that, yeah, when people steal something, that sales go down. Okay? Um, and I, I, I sort of wrote some of those papers back a while ago. But after a little while, as I wanted to define myself in my career, I started asking myself, you know, it is interesting to know that, and it is interesting to qu try to quantify how much of the losses in the industry are actually due to file sharing. And by the way, the estimates are anywhere between one-fifth of the decline in the music industry to the entire decline, right? And it kind of depends on who you believe. But I started thinking, you know, the next interesting question is, all right, you know, maybe you think this is bad, maybe you think this is good, and it probably partly depends on whether you think that profits will be tied to the innovation of new creative works in the future, right? But at the end of the day, if you think that there's a problem here, then it's worth thinking about, are there ways that we can deal with this? What are the, some of the solutions to this? So I've started a line of work thinking about that. And I've attacked it from both, sort of both sides. I've looked at, looked at business strategies that are meant to deal with uh, file sharing. And now I thought, you know what? A, a, a couple of people have looked at business strategies, but very few people, in fact, I couldn't find any economic studies measuring the effect of direct government intervention, or like a law, again, an anti-piracy law, on file sharing behavior or on sales. So I thought, this is something that I'd like to look at. And then I looked around and realized there weren't a lot of laws out there to analyze, at least not ones that I thought that were really well enforced or that had a chance of having a big effect. And then 2009 comes along, and France, I guess because, mostly because of Sarkozy was in office, passed what I would consider probably one of the strongest anti-piracy laws that we've seen. All right, so Hadopi, we'll skip through this, all right. Hadopi is the creation of inter internet law in France. And the law basically creates a Hadopi agency, a government agency, right? And it allows co content, co content owners or copyright owners to essentially monitor internet users' behavior. And they're allowed to look for one thing, copyright infringement, right? And there's a whole sort of technological background as to how they do this, right? But they're allowed to look for copyright infringement, right? And if they find a, a user guilty of copyright infringement, they can send this information, and, and they have to work with the ISPs, the internet service providers, to do this. But if they find somebody guilty of that, they send the list of people who are guilty of it to the Hadopi agency. And what ha happens is this. It's a graduated response law. It's sort of a, a, colloquially the three strikes law. So the first time that you're found guilty, you get an email warning. Stop doing it. Okay? The second time that you're found guilty, you get a, a warning by mail from the government. And it's sort of stop doing it. And also there's something in there about, by the way, if you think your internet connection was, was hijacked, you really need to secure it because you're responsible for your IP address. Okay? And then, at the end of the day, if, there's a, if you're guilty a third time, then you can be subject to fines up to something like $1,000 or 1,000 euros, and you can have your internet privileges removed. Essentially, you go on an internet blacklist for up to one month where no ISP in France can give you internet access for up to one month. Now, originally, this law, they tried to get this, so this law didn't in, contain any judicial review. And that didn't, hold, that didn't really pass muster. So now, actually, they have to take you to court on the third offense in order to get these, these penalties imposed. All right? There's been a lot of controversy around this law. All right? I'm not saying whether these statements are true or not. I'm not an expert on this. All right? But here's some of the controversy that has been raised. One is that the cost of Hadopi was talked about, just the, the pure cost of, inf, you know, sort of implementing Hadopi and enforcing it was thought to be too high, right? And there's been these stories in the news about how not only is the cost of their cost of the government there for the taxpayers, but there's been stories in the news that 
internet service providers are charging more because of the infrastructure that they had to set up. I don't know if that's true or not, but this is one of the things that made the law controversial. Another is that Hadopi may violate the net neutrality principle and that thus have intangible costs. Um, I don't know whether that's true or not. It depends on your interpretation of net neutrality, whether you think that the pipes are still dumb when, you know, dumb pipes, right, when, uh, when content providers can monitor for this one type of infringement, all right? But that was what part of the controversy, was that, hey, this is going to stifle the internet. Um, the third one is that Hadopi may hold internet users responsible for hijacked connections, and that technically still is true. That, that is possible, right? So that was certainly something that was legally debated, and it was sort of, you know, people having, holding very strong philosophical opinions about whether that was right or not. And then finally, there was uh, sort of this, inter this interesting thing. Um, you know, you think about basic human rights, and you think about sort of like property, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, whatever. Apparently someone, and I don't know the exact details on this because it's hard to get it right out of the media, which sometimes might distort this, but apparently someone in the UN may have declared that internet access is a basic human right, and therefore the Hadopi was violating that. Um, it's kind of interesting because 15 years ago I didn't even have the internet, right? But uh, in any case, that led to a whole slew of headlines saying that the UN has declared that the internet is a human right. So the point is there's been a lot of controversy around this. And if you go to France, you'll find that there are people on both sides of this. Some people believe that Hadopi was a good law. Some people think that this is, have huge philosophical problems with it or think that it's ineffective, right? I think all of that's really interesting. The problem is I'm not qualified to comment on most of that. But one thing that was really a big deal that came up was many people said, you know what, this is an expensive law. It has tangible and possibly intangible costs, but it's not going to do anything. They said, you know, First of all, we don't even know that file sharing hurts sales. Well, that's wrong, right? But also, on the other end, we don't really know that this is going to affect file sharing behavior. A lot of people said, you know what, I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to find my way around the law. You know, I can use virtual private networks. I, I, you know, I can download software that masks my behavior. In fact, I'm going to go pirate more just because I'm so mad, mad about this law. And you can find those comments on the internet. Of course, the problem is that you're getting a very small sample of people, but they're very public. They're very loud. So I thought, you know what, this is something I am qualified to do, to measure the effect of this law on legal sales. Let's talk about, a little bit about the history of the law, because you'll see this is going to come out to be really, kind of be really important when we talk about this. Um, in 2008, the bill was presented to the Senate, and it was passed, the Hadopi bill. And then in March 2009, the bill was supported by the National Assembly, but then rejected. I don't know all of the details of exactly how that happened. All right, so it was supported and then rejected. Um, then there were some slight amendments made to it. It goes back, and in May 2009, both the National Assembly and the Senate in France both back this revised version of Hadopi. So now, okay, is it in effect or is it not in effect? I don't know. What I do know is that the opposition party then sent it to the Constitutional Council saying it was unconstitutional, and the Constitutional Council rejected the main portion of the bill. So now maybe I guess it's not an effect. I'm not enough of a legal scholar in France to even tell you, all right? I'm, certain, I'm pretty certain that the average French citizen isn't really aware either, all right? And that's going to factor really prominently into the results. Now, October 2009, the Constitutional Council backs an amended version of the bill, and so now it's actually in effect. But you know, there's a big time between getting a law into effect and then getting everything set up. So it actually wasn't until about a year later that the first wave notices, the first wave of first wave noti of first notices went out, all right? So there's this question of like, even if you think the law is going to have an effect, when's it going to have an effect? Is it going to be the heightened awareness when everybody finds out about it? You know, like the government's watching my internet, right? That could be, that's certainly reasonable. And there's a lot of literature, criminology literature that says that policy shifts can have an effect before they're actually implemented when there's a heightened awareness around, oh, this behavior, the government doesn't like this behavior, or it's stigmatized, or I could get caught, or I'm not really sure whether the law is in effect or not, or just, you know, Maybe I always thought it was wrong, and now the government's sort of sending a signal that, yeah, you really ought to remember that you had a problem with this, right? I don't know, all right? That's one time it could have an effect. Or if you're a perfect, if you're sort of um, homo economicus, right, the perfectly rational consumer, you're going to file share all you want, in fact, maybe even more, right up until the day that the law is truly effective, because remember, you have perfect information because you're homo economicus, right? And then you're going to that day maybe convert to buying legally. So you could think that when the law becomes effective, maybe right after the Constitutional Council sort of accepts the amended version is the day, or you could think that it's when the first wave of notices start going out. All right, so there's a couple different times you think that this law could have an effect, and that's something I was going to have to deal with in this research. All right, and the whole methodology is going to have to be set up to deal with the, the sort of, you know, this sort of, I don't know what the word I wanted, the uncertainty surrounding what I expect to see. So here's the question. 
The question is, what's the effect of Hadopi on French music sales? The problem is, and the reason that it's hard, is that if you just look at French music sales over time, there's plenty of reasons they could be changing. In fact, I'm going to look at digital sales for a couple of reasons I'll talk about in a minute. Well, guess what? The digital market's growing over time no matter what. Okay? The whole world's digital market is growing. So the issue that we face often as economists is that we observe, okay, we observe the red line. That's the French sales data. But what we would really like to observe is what I call the, this hypothetical, what economists call the counterfactual. All right? In a world where Hadopi had not been passed, what would French sales have looked like? That's what we would like to observe. Because if we could observe that, here's where Hadopi passed, then the difference between the red line and this hypothetical blue line is the true effect of Hadopi. But you don't really observe that world, right? There's only one dimension here. We only get to see when Hadopi gets passed. So that's the challenge, and that's what I'm going to try to do, and I'm going to try to do it convincingly, and that's, that's sort of the whole point of writing this paper. Right? And this is something, simulating the counterfactual is something that economists tend to do really well. Okay? So the methodology is something that economists call difference in difference model. Um, another way of thinking about it, a difference in difference model is not very far from something that you might think of as like a control treatment. So you might think of having like a control group and then a treatment group. All right, in this case, France is the treated country, and maybe you could look for a control group of countries that you think would simulate what France's sales would have looked like in the absence of Hadopi. And that's generally what I'm going to try to do here. Um, I found a group of five fairly similar countries. I actually had, I had, had data on iTunes sales of 30 different countries. And what I did is I looked through the data to find what set of countries pre-Hadopi have the closest time trend to France for a period of like say, you know, 52 weeks or you know, 70 weeks or something like that. And essentially what it came out was a group that made a lot of sense. A bunch of European countries where you, know, you might think that cultural, I mean, certainly France is not the same as every one of these countries, but you might think that culturally there's, on average, the music markets here are gonna be somewhat similar. And then when you average all five of these countries together to, you know, you add a random noise to random noise and you get less noise, right? So you kind of average that out and you end up with a situation where maybe you could believe that this, these five countries are going to sort of tend to look like what Francis Sales looked like before Hadopi. And I'm going to show you that that's true. Then I had to figure out, all right, well, when do I think we would see the effect of the law? When did people really find out about it? What's this, you know, so when did, people, when did this law become salient, right? When did people think, hey, this could be affecting me right now? And I'm going to have to figure that out. Okay? And then finally, I'm going to use some genre data to try to convince you that my results, results are really about Hadopi and not some other coincidence. So I had panel data on weekly iTunes sales. So basically, for six different countries, France and five control countries, I had weekly iTunes sales figures. I had it for tracks and albums. Okay? And I had this for, the, for, not the entire music industry, for the four major labels. So the aggregate for the four major labels. All right? So the only ones that I didn't have are the indies, which are probably about 25 or 30% of the French market. So I had about 70% of the market here, which is probably pretty representative. Okay? Um, it's only digital data, so this paper really is only going to get to look at the effect of this law on one form of media, music, in one sales channel, iTunes. The reason is one, turns out the digital data are way more reliable. You should see what the physical data look like. It's pretty hard, sometimes it's pretty hard to work with them. Okay? And two, uh, we have, there's actually a lot of research says, that says that people tend, these days are sort of tied to a channel, digital versus physical. So if you think that any pirates are possibly going to convert because of a law, they're much more likely to move to digital channels like iTunes or maybe streaming channels, which I don't observe, right, than they are to move back to physical channels. All right? So really, I'm, I'm not going to sort of quantify the entire effect of the law. I'm here to say, does this law affect consumer behavior or the people that t are speaking up loudly on the internet right, and really it doesn't have any effect on consumer behavior whatsoever. All right? So you can think of this, as, what I'm going to do is try to get a bottom line, un, sort of, what am, I, what am I looking for, lower bound estimate on the effect of the law. All right? One form of media in one channel. I also, in order to figure out a little bit about the whole Google Trends, oh, excuse me, in order to figure out about when sort of this law became prominent in people's minds, I used Google Trends data. So Google Trends can tell you when people are doing searches for what terms, and it can also tell you a lot about media articles surrounding certain terms. All right? So I'm able to go out there and basically do searches, you know, figure out the number of searches for Hadopi in France, or the number of searches for Three Strikes Law in France and I'm able to find with that week by week over the period of time that I'm interested in. So I'm able to figure out when citizens are actually really becoming aware of this, right? And when they're really sort of fervently searching for it. So here's some descriptive statistics. Just, this doesn't really go very far towards making any points about the data. 
This is sort of just to show you, yeah, these countries are different. This is the um, iTunes track unit sales, and here's the album unit sales uh, in thousands. And you can see they're very different in terms of the overall level across countries. But fortunately, with the difference in difference approach, you can normalize, you can normalize for that. So that's not a problem. The only question is, on a percentage basis, do they tend to trend similarly over time? And I can show you that. So then we run a model, and this is you know, some fancy economy, you know, sort of, so just some Greek letters. This is what do you have to do to get published in economics journals, right? But it turns out that there's a very simple interpretation of this. Really what I'm going to do is look at percent, average percent change in the control group over time and average percent change in France over time and see if they're the same or if they differ. That's what this is really doing. And then there's just a bunch of math and matrix algebra behind doing it right. Okay? So if I take this, this is not distorted. There's no trickery here. This is not distorting the data in any way. All I'm doing is basically plotting it a way that it will make sense to you. Here's what it looks like. The red line is the law, is, it turns out to be the natural log. It turns out that that's easier for looking at percentage changes, all right? Is the natural log of France's iTunes track sales. And the blue line is the natural log of the average of the control group, okay? And if you look at this, for about, let's see, from July 2008, and I can go back and further and it's still true, from July 2008 all the way up until about March or April 2009, they tend to move almost in lockstep. There's a couple bleeps here, but basically, there's no statistical difference between these two time trends, France and the control group. They're statistically indistinguishable from each other. For a period that's you know, almost a year, and frankly, if I had data going back, I bet you it would, it would go for at least a full year. They move the same. And that should lend you some sort of credibility to the idea that, you know what, in the absence of the law, which I'm going to show you this is a very significant date for Hadopi, in the absence of the law, it turns out that the control group really does tell you something about what France would look like if the law hadn't been passed. Because it did for a year until the passage of the law. Okay? So, you know, it's kind of, it should be pretty credible to you that France that should have contained the, stayed the same as the control group in the absence of some sort of intervention. Now, you notice that at this date, somewhere around March 2009 or April 2009, that France rises above the control group. So let's ask, is that date actually meaningful? Well, if I plot the Google Trends data, the green line is the Google Trends relative index for searches for Hadopi, and it's the same if you look for Three Strikes Law. Okay, or if you look for them in French. Um, what you end up seeing is that it's actually very low, and then we get one little peak in March, which is, you know, the March was a relevant, it was an important date, and then we get a bigger peak in April, and then we get the highest peak ever, and this is a really huge peak. We're talking that, let's see, so searches in this week were, um, I guess, uh, 23 times higher than the average week throughout the data. So like this is really, I mean, we're talking about going from hundreds of thousands to millions or something like that, right? So this is the period of time when people are really finding out about this law and it's becoming hotly debated in the press. And by the way, if you do this not just for searches but for media articles, you get a picture that looks very, very similar to this. So you notice that right here, after the first peak, you see France is moving up above the control group. After the second peak, it's moving up more. And after the third peak, it even distances itself further. And then that distance remains relatively constant with some exception in here that I'm not sure about throughout the whole time. And notice that France and the control still tend to move almost the exact same, right? Almost in lockstep, the same peaks and, uh, what are they called, nadirs, nadirs, whatever, you know, bottoms, right? Um, other than the fact that France is above the control group starting right when the French citizens start finding out about this Hadopi law. If you um, look at the picture for albums, it looks the same. So this is album sales on iTunes. And here's something else interesting. Um, I can't, I'm not allowed to show this, but I have data on each of the individual labels. And each of the individual labels can't really legally collude in terms of marketing activities or pricing activities. So you could, <clears throat> from the perspective of pricing or marketing, you might think of each label as like an independent experiment. Each label's graph looks much like this as well, if you were to plot it for the label. I can't show you because it's protected data but it looks like this as well. So every, this isn't like one label driving all this. Every single label shows the same picture. All right. So if you then believe that this blue line is that hypothetical, the counterfactual, that dashed blue line from before, the, the grail, right? What would France's sales have looked like in the absence of Hadopi? If you believe that, then if you measure the average gap between the red line and the blue line after this date here, that tells you the effect that the law had. Right? That measures the effect of the Hadopi law. Well, I can slightly adjust the model and put some a little more slightly fancy math up on the board, but all I'm really doing is just running a model that measures that gap, right? That average size of that gap. 
and I'm going to report coefficients and standard errors, and this is how I'd have to do to publish it in a journal somewhere, but I can interpret these for you pretty easily. This is basically the change in the control group from before Hadopi to after Hadopi, and this is the change in French sales over and above any change in the control group. In other words, these numbers here represent the size of the gap after, between the red and the blue line after Hadopi was passed. All right? This says that track sales were up by about 22.5%, which is a pretty big number. 22.5% increase in track sales on iTunes caused by the law, and album sales were up about 25%. So album sales, this isn't just they were up in France by 25%, this is caused by the law. This is up in France over and above any change in the rest of the market. These are all significant at the 95% confidence level for you statisticians out there, if there are any. Um, there's sort of an interesting question, though. People would, you know, with, with a loaded issue like this, where people have very visceral opinions about it, you figure people are going to try to pick this apart. And one thing they could say is maybe something else happened in France and just happened to be at the same time as the Google Trend Spike Index, and, that's, and that other something is driving increased sales on iTunes in France. It's all, you're always such subject to that kind of criticism. And in social sciences, it's very rare that you can say something definitively. But I think we can sort of get at that a little bit because we know that some genres tend to be very heavily pirated and some genres tend not to be pirated, even controlling for popularity. And I can show you tons of research and piracy data showing you that this is true. Um, one of the things that we know is that rap is disproportionately pirated, even, even you know, sort of conditional on popularity. So you take a rock song and a rap song, both equally popular, Piracy levels for the rap song are, on average, going to be higher. We also know that jazz, classical, folk tend to be less pirated, even when they're the same popularity. In fact, there's one other. Christian music tends to be, have very low levels of piracy, even when it's really popular Christian rock. Right? It's almost intuitive, right? But I, you know, I'm, you know, as an economist, I, have no, I just know that that's what the data say. So it's interesting. We can do another test. We can say, look, if this is really Hadopi having this effect, causing that gap, then you would think that the gap should be really big for rap, and should be really, really small for the less pirated genres. And if we don't see that, then the critics are right. You know, I probably am getting something else. So what we can do is we can run this model, but we can run it for each genre. And when you do that, for the low pirated genres, you find that the increase is only about 8% as opposed to 25 or 22. You find that for the average pirated genres, rock and pop, the increase is pretty close to the average. This probably is about, seven, exponentiate this, is probably about nine, 19%. And that for rap, exponentiate this, it's like 30%. Wow. So indeed, we saw the exact ordering of the, you know, the, that, the size of that increase that we think is caused by the law was highest for the high pirated genres and lowest for the low pirated genres. So now, if you have a problem with this paper, what you really need to say is that something happened in France, it just so happened to happen in April 2009, it also drives iTunes sales, and by the way, it drives rap sales, but it doesn't drive jazz or classical sales. If you believe that, I think that you can, you know, I mean, I can't argue with you yet. Right? But that's, what, that's sort of like, that's what I'm trying to do is I'm saying the most logical interpretation of this is that the law seems to have had an impact. But you'd be surprised just how fervently people will argue against that. So when this paper got put out on the internet before I'd even, it's not even peer reviewed yet, it's under a review at a journal, I put it out on the internet because this is a timely issue and people started picking it apart. And two days later, Le Monde, the French national newspaper, rad, ran an article on the front page of their text sec section saying, you know, this is really just because of iPhones. They said, the French just so happened to get really into iPhones in March 2009. The other countries didn't. And by the way, people who buy iPhones like rap, but they don't like jazz or classical. And they don't like rock as much as they like rap. And that was the, that was the text of, that was really the text of their article. And to me, it was sort of like one, okay, right? But two, it was also, I appreciate that you appealed to like a rational argument. I think I should go into the data and see if that's true. So I got iPhone sales data. So this is right, so this is what I said could have caused this. So I got iPhone sales data. Here's the, here's the article in the month. And if you look, here's the penetration of iPads, iPhones, and iPods in France versus the control group. And you can see that the increase, they're all increasing because these are popular devices getting more popular. But the increase in France is from 2008 to 2009 is pretty much the same as the increase in the control group. And then if you look from 2008 to 2010, the increase in the control group is actually even higher than it is in France. So there's a lot of people on the internet saying uh, Le Monde debunks study by US American you know, economist authors. Um, for some reason, Le Monde won't publish my, my commentary that that can't be true. I sent it to them like three times and they won't publish it. Um, but the other thing you can do, and this is kind of fun, this is where it gets fun to be an economist. Notice that the increase in 
Spain is actually really high. Way high. the increase in i device like you know iPhone sales in Spain is way higher than it is in any other country, including France. So I ran the same model. This is one of the fun things. I ran the same models I did before, but I ran it comparing Spain to the control group. And guess what? Spain looked the exact same as the control group throughout the entire picture. No increase in Spain. So there's no evidence that iPhone sales even can drive iTunes sales, let alone that there's anything different about iPhone sales in France. So this is the kind of debate that comes up. The next thing I know people are going to say, it's all streaming. It's because France has Deezer and Deezer people stream, and when they stream on Deezer, they want to buy more music on iTunes. I'm not sure. I kind of thought they were substitutes. But you know, I mean, you know, we'll see. This is the kind of debate that comes up when you write a paper like this, and I think it's fun, and I'll probably explore the streaming data to see if that's true. So at the end of the day, what we're concluding is that the most likely explanation here is that Hadopi caused a 23% 23, 23 increase to 25% increase in iTunes sales. Um, if you do all the numerical calculations on this, you discover that it looks like, in terms of digital music sales on iTunes, the increase was about 14, uh, thir 13 to 14 mil uh, million euros per year. All right? Now you have to remember, that's just one form of, mu one form of media in one sales channel. I'm not saying if it's a good law or a bad law because I think there's lots of intangibles here that I'm not equipped to deal with. All I'm saying is that there's one question as to whether it would have an intended effect or not. Can you influence consumer behavior with a demand side government intervention that, goes, that sort, of like, sort of reinforces the idea to consumers, hey, this is illegal and you could actually be penalized for it? And the answer seems to be yes. Right? Now, you've got a lot of people out there on the internet right now saying, you know, I don't know, Danaher is a music industry stooge, uh, Danaher was paid, you know, and so on, right? And it's funny, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of having fun with it, but at the end of the day, I went into this with no preconceived notions, no philosophical bet, I just wanted to know the answer. And the data seemed to suggest it pretty strongly. But as soon as you write about something that's very, um, you know, that people have very visceral or almost religious theological views sometimes, then that's the kind of controversy you get. And then it's fun to have a discussion about it. There is a limitation here. This Hadopi law is sort of unique. One, it's got the graduated response, the sanctions, right? Two, it's actually got a lot of, they call it the carrot and the, as the stick is the sanctions. The carrot is also, there's a it also involves an educational campaign. So Hadopi conducts extensive educational awareness throughout France about, hey, piracy is bad, or hey, you know, support your artists, or hey, here are way, different means of buying music. Um, and they've in, edu sort of gone through a number of sort of positive initiatives to change consumer behavior at the same time. It's all part of Hadopi. And then there was the media awareness, which I don't know if it's ever been replicated other than the SOPA law in the US. I mean, so I think SOPA in the US was probably the highest level of media awareness around copyright law. I, it seems to me that Hadopi was probably the second highest ever. All right? So I can't disentangle the effects of the carrot from the stick from the media awareness. All right? I don't know if this was the perfect storm and all three are required to get this effect, or I don't know if just one of them can do that. I'm very open and honest about that. What I do know is that a direct government intervention combined with an awareness that happened as a result of it and a big public debate did affect consumer behavior. And that's it. Thank you very much. That's uh, certainly uh, provocative uh, comments by, uh, by both of you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to open this up. These are very uh, seasoned uh, speakers, and so don't feel hesitant at all at throwing anything you want at them. Now, we know that Robert hasn't slept very much, so you might get a little more um, from him. You mean that figuratively? Uh, that you wouldn't have <laughs> any questions. Yeah. Any questions, any questions. I told them that none of you have tomatoes on the way up, and they're unlikely to get anything thrown at them other than digital tomato. Um, so, if you've got any questions or comments, now is the, uh, the time. Anybody want to start with a comment or a, uh, a question? Um, I just have a question for Mr. Danaher. You, um, I don't know if you can answer this question based on the sort of time frame that you were looking at, but I'm wondering if... Uh, that law just sort of, you know, you would uh, interpret it as impacting a segment and now, you know, 20% of the population has sort of been impacted by that? Or are you sort of expecting that, you know, the more and more of the population will be adopting it kind of thing? Or are you expecting the sort of sales to continually rise? Um, or is it just this impacted, you know, maybe 45 to 55 year olds that thought, oh geez, I better stop with the music swapping and then, you know, still a, another segment of the population is going to keep doing it. Yeah, so that's actually a really good question. Um, so 
let me point out two things. One, something I can say directly from the data is you see that increase occur, occur pretty quickly during the, well, the awareness occurred pretty quickly, and then that increase in sales occurs pretty quickly. And then it sends, seems to, seem to remain sort of stable, so it didn't seem to get any larger over time. Um, so it does seem like it sort of affected some people and moved them, and then there's other people that may, maybe didn't move, right, and that it didn't seem to reach out to. But during the period of time that I studied, uh, the first wave of notices went out, and then second, the first wave of second notices started going out. During the period of time that I had data for, no third wave notices went out. In fact, only recently has anybody actually been brought to court to lose the internet. So I do think it's possible, I don't know, and I'm, I'm hoping they'll give me the data to look, um, I think it's possible that, one, if nobody ever had their internet shut off, that maybe over time people would stop believing this law was going to be effective, and maybe you could even see a reversion, I don't know. Uh, but as they're starting to shut people's internet off, I do think it's possible that the publicity around that and the media, the media is really covering that very tensely. Um, I think that you could see yet another shift in behavior and another increase. I'm not saying that I know that. I'm hypothesizing it's possible, and I'd really like to see the data. Um, I think it's interesting that we see what we saw before anybody actually suffered a penalty. Thanks. Any other uh, questions or comments? So I've got a question, Robert, for you. I think we have one. Oh, sorry, is there a question? Oh, go ahead. I found both talks really fascinating and quite stimulating. Um, I, I thought there might be uh, one um, assumption you might be making. And my experience with iTunes is it often doesn't have the kind of music that I like to, that I like to access. So I'm wondering, you, you know, you're measuring the increase in iTunes sales in a population, presumably, of people who are disincentived from accessing files on the internet generally. Can you repeat that? Who are just what? Well, you're, you're measuring the increase in iTunes sales. But that does not, but the, the availability of music on iTunes is not equal to what's available on the internet generally. So I'm just wondering if, if you're assuming that people who are disincentived from the illegal downloading are shifting over to iTunes and shifting to, to what's available in iTunes. It seems like, would you not also be measuring the drop in illegal uh, uh, downloading? Because I, I presume that would be available to the industry. So instead of in, in measuring the increase in iTunes sales, could you not also measure the drop in illegal downloads? And I just think that you know, it, the same music's not available in iTunes as it is on the internet. I, I know a, a large amount is, and perhaps the most popular music is. But there are many artists who are not available on iTunes. And presumably, those artists were being downloaded by people who wanted their music. They're not suddenly going to now shift to iTunes and find that music. So I'm just wondering if there's any, any measurement of a drop in downloading as but, opposed to an increase in iTunes sales. That's, that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't think that, I, I think the first part that there's an assumption is, um, I'm not so much assuming that people will move, necessarily move. I'm asking, does anybody move? Um, so for the first part, I don't think I necessarily assume that. But uh, in terms of the drop in piracy, um, some pir there is collection of data on pirated activity. Um, and I think that is available to the industry. Uh, the problem is that the industry is not free to publish with it, and therefore they're not free to show that to me. Um, and I don't know exactly what went into the contract that created that. Um, so unfortunately, I can't measure whether there was a decrease in pirated activity or not. Um, what I do see, though, is that it seems most likely to conclude that there was because it's, it's, not it's hard but not impossible to argue that there, was a, that, that there wasn't an increase in iTunes sales that seems to be caused by this law. I know that, right, so therefore, I would assume that there's some conversion. Do I think everybody's converting? Or, no, I think lots of people are still pirating. Do I think some people stop pirating and then don't buy? Absolutely. But I do, and I wish that I could measure what percent of people stop, who stop pirating go to buy, because that would be really interesting. Unfortunately, I'm not free to work with that data. Well, wouldn't Hadopi have access to that data, though? I mean, presumably, they're the government agency. They, they must be measuring this, because they're the ones sending out the notices. They, I would think they would know if there's less need of notices. I'm just wondering if that data is available, because I think that would, be, would, would really show a, 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 the, the absolute. Like, in other words, you're, you're looking for a secondary effect in iTunes sales as opposed to an okay. immediate effect in drop in sales. I actually think, not to, to disagree without being disagreeable, I think that's the primary effect. Because when you talk about decrease in file sharing or increase in file sharing, 
you know, you don't know how much a file sharing replaces a purchase. When people started to file share, they were downloading songs. Then they started downloading albums. Now they download entire discographies. So if you now download 80, eight ACDC albums, you probably wouldn't have bought eight. You might only have bought one. So the idea that eight things are being illegally downloaded, it may not matter that much, because what you want to try to get a handle on is what's the harm? So clearly, some things that are downloaded illegally replace purchases. Clearly, some don't. So I think what you, this is what I think, and again, I may be prejudiced here because I see things as a business journalist. This, to me, is the data you would want because illegal downloading, people download for all sorts of reasons. So this might be better data in the sense that it's more primary. But that's yeah, no, not I, an economist's I feel like, I mean, take. I was always interested in the sales data because to me, the second, the, the second most important effect is what did it do to piracy, but the most important effect is what did it do to sales. However, I would love access to the piracy data because if you saw a drop in piracy, that would be yet another confirmation of what's going on. And, you know, the, the thing is, does Hadopi have that data? Um, I don't know. If Hadopi published a study on their own saying that file sharing was down after they passed the law, do you, would you believe it? Oh, I would. No, I, I found. You know, I'm not saying I wouldn't. I'm saying, um, you know, I think it would be, I think it would be highly criticized in the media just because it's always an assumption that they'll, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, so, I'm not intending to be, you know. Be, I'd have to go out and get the data yeah. from an independent source, and I'm just not sure where I can get that. Sure. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. Any other? Uh, Robert, I am halfway through your book, wonderful book. Thank you. And if you have an answer there, then I'm sorry, up front. But uh, there are a few issues, I think, with the copy protection that you certainly didn't mention here. One is that the argument goes that it's just not convenient. It's not that, you know, there are a lot of freedom fighters who say, hey, uh, this will stifle, you know, uh, creative people. But there are people who say, because so copy protection is so terrible, just cannot use this thing, right? That's my first question. And another question is related to it. Um, uh, you know, in your book, uh, companies like Google, etc., they are big bad guys, really, because you're saying there is a business issue. They have interest, vested interest, in making everything indexable, free, because because their advertisement-based uh, search model works like that, right? But then there are a lot of companies, big technological companies like Intel and Cisco, who have vested interest in providing technological solutions to copy protection, but it still doesn't work. So those are my two questions. Okay. As far as why is that, really? Well, as far as copy protection, you know, there's a lot of things about. One interesting thing, and I just did it. I was on just on BNN and had a sort of similar conversation. You get a lot of feedback with people saying, you know, this isn't available when I want, the way I want, under the terms I want. And the, the, the idea is, well, this is really inconvenient. And they often expect me to say, no, no, it's fine. Yeah, of course it's inconvenient. But, and no one's saying that, but the question is, as a legal, as an economic argument, I'm not sure how much sense that makes. If you don't want to buy something with DRM on it, you're free not to buy it. Um, if you don't like the way something's sold, if it's only sold as an album instead of as singles, you're free not to buy it. As a legal argument, you know, what's convenient is not always what's legal. I, I, and I people agree. say, you know, I enjoy watching Game of Thrones. I'll explain this, why I use this as an example. I, I want to watch Game of Thrones right away. Right now, it's only on HBO, and then only after a year is it available on iTunes. And people say, oh my god, I want to watch Game of Thrones right away on iTunes. I don't want to buy, buy HBO. But if you look at the business of it, HBO funds those shows. They fund a lot of shows. Not all of them succeed because they want to sell HBO subscriptions. iTunes is very much a secondary market for them. We can all agree that that's annoying. I think Game of Thrones should be provided. Well, I haven't seen it yet because I'm waiting. I don't get HBO. But I think it should be provided free to every citizen in every d democracy, because it's, it looks like it rocks. I, but You're missing out. I, I think so. Well, I can't get HBO in Berlin, so it's not. But I think that I'm not sure what that really 
means as an economic argument or as a legal argument. I certainly get that restrictions on goods are annoying. But you know, sometimes you walk into a, a store and they have a, the jacket fits you, the pants don't. You can't just switch up the suit. There's a lot of things that are, a lot of these inconveniences are really costs. You, yeah. buy, you buy a CD, it costs X. You can do with it things Y. And I think you just have to rationalize that into your purchase. If you don't want any music with DRM, don't buy music with DRM. And, and I think one thing that, you know, when I started thinking about the book, I thought for a minute about dealing with patents too. And one reason I didn't was that, you know, medicines especially, there's, there's often like a much more serious argument for infringement that you could save someone's life with patented medicine. We're talking about Game of Thrones. I mean, I'm sure it's real good, but it's probably not a life or death thing. A lot of arguments from the other side, you hear, what about you know, important research books, what about educational materials? But these are very, very much the exceptions. I'll just share with you, I, Barry heard me say this already today, I'm sorry. The most popular pirated movie last year was Fast Five. This is not something that should be in the public domain by now if copyright didn't last so long. This is not an educational, I can't even say this without laughing, it's not an educational movie. I haven't seen it, but it doesn't look educational. It's not, you know, there's no societal value in having more people see it. There may be societal value in having fewer people see it, but it's all other. So, you know, there's no, like, sort of overweening good. There are things that there shouldn't be a market for. You know, the government in a civilized country would provide a minimum level of health care to all citizens. We don't want a market for that. Maybe there shouldn't be a market for textbooks in the same way as entertainment books. But are we really that afraid of a market for Game of Thrones? I, I know I skewed from your question, but I do think it relates in that we have agreed that it's okay to have a market for entertainment. Let's just leave it up to the market. And if people are annoyed about it, they'll, they'll stop buying it. So we so haven't we seen differentiate that. then by the the type of work. What about the the documentary filmmaker, for example, that wants to take a, a film and use it to uh, to do something as part of a, a project and it's TPM. But would you say that there's a difference there or all work should be treated the same or should we make distinctions based on uh, some way in which they're looked at? Some are for entertainment, some aren't. Well, what we've seen in the U.S. that I think is a pretty reasonable judgment is that in terms of fair use, which is roughly akin to fair dealing, if you want to use the most powerful argument to break TPM legally was that it's a free speech argument. If you want to incorporate a work in another work, the free speech argument to do that is much more powerful than, oh my god, this is so annoying. Although the second is more common. There is also and, a privacy issue, right? If you remember the Sony case in about 2000, the BMG copy protection? That's actually... Well, so it's, it's also a big issue, right? I would say that's different. Okay, I would say that's different because it wasn't breaking a lock. It was the issue involved doing something to your computer. It wasn't yeah. breaking lock. But as far as, this, the court basically said there's an analog hole. If you want a, to use a piece of a movie in your documentary, you can aim a camera at the television. The response from the other side is, oh my God, that's annoying. Sure, the law does not give you, you know, convenience is not a right. I, and I understand that it's annoying. I understand that it's absurd. but. The courts have said, in the U.S., I believe they called it, they, they really, I forget what the line was, I have it in the book. In the U.S., the, the judge was really like, oh, come on. I mean, literally, I mean, that's not a quote, but the judge seemed pretty exasperated. She said, you know, you have the right, you don't have the right to have it easy. I understand it's annoying, but it's, it's, it's a hard argument to make legally. I believe we don't have time for seconds. Okay. So, so let me ask, Brett, if I can ask you a question. We're, and we're not going to get into the niceties of, of C11. Um, no. But we're in the midst of copyright reform, and Canada's adopted a, a notice a notice system. So it's a system where a rights holder will send a notice to an ISP, and ISP will then send it to a customer. Uh, it's not graduated. The customer get, may get one or two or three over time. They're not counted up. There's no express sanction. Um, what would your data suggest? Would your data suggest that if uh, there's a, an educational program together with the notice or in the notice, it will be effective? 
and uh, what would you expect in relation to the Hadoki data? In other words, how, how close do you get if you have education but no sanction? Sure. Um, so, you know, caveat, I'm now sort of giving you my educated opinion as opposed to speaking directly from data. Um, but I think one of the things we saw, one of the most surprising things that we saw in the data were the fact that before the law was actually in effect, we saw the effect of the law. And what really happened was when people started debating it and either got scared or got the message or got the signal from government or, you know, or just started thinking, oh yeah, right, I, I always thought artists should be you know, rewarded and, and now I, you know, this law is reminding us that I don't know what it is, but the awareness seemed to be sort of key. Um, and I'm not saying it was just awareness, because I think that the graduate response sort of is part of what created that public debate and controversy. But so at the end of the day, um, a notice and notice regime is less likely to cause controversy. It's less likely to get as much media attention. So to that degree, I don't think it would be as effective. To the degree that education is added, that might help. That might help that situation. Um, I just don't. I'm guessing, but I don't think it would be as effective as what we saw in France, and not necessarily because people aren't going to lose their internet, because nobody lost their internet in my data either, but because it's not going to create the same controversy, media headlines, awareness, and sort of the same signal sent to people. Right, but there's no way of telling if it's 25 to 15 or 25 to 5. That would be something you'd have to study? Well, I mean, with the right data, we can certainly figure it out. I mean, I think this methodology could work for a lot of different policy events, right? right. So, any um, any other questions? So I've got one more I want to ask you, and just on on, on price. When when you were when you were going through your data, you, you talked about uh, the difference in iTunes sales. Was there an effect on the price at which music was sold in the market? So in other words, sometimes you can say uh, that the pirate. Uh, piracy displaces sales, and other times you might have a theory as to whether or not it would affect price. Does your data suggest that the price would be affected, or do you have any views as to whether the price would be affected as well by piracy? Um, so, in relation to the paper itself about Hadopi, um, I know that there were no major coordinated price changes differentially in France relative to the other as a result of this law. So it wasn't like, oh, we have this law, now we're going to increase the price on everything to $1.29 because we can, oh, right? or so. euros. Yeah. Um, so there wasn't like a sort of immediate reaction in that sense, I know that. Um, but outside of the realm of this, just in terms of sort of pricing and piracy, um, I would, you and I were talking a little bit earlier. but. I think that one of the interesting things is I, I told you that there's all these papers out there about the effect of, that file sharing has had on sales. And that's been usually on sales units. So how many pirated downloads leads to one lost sale? But I think what's been mostly ignored in the empirical work is that piracy also is sort of like, ha, exerts a downward pressure on prices. And to the degree that we haven't studied that, we're underestimating the effect that piracy has had on the media and the content industries because we haven't really been able to simulate the counterfactual of what would prices have looked like in the absence of piracy or would we have Spotify, which is a lower revenue service in the absence of piracy. Now, I like Spotify. I, Spotify is in Canada, yeah, or no? Is it licensed in Canada? So mu music streaming services. So music streaming services, would they have come about in the absence of piracy? Not sure. Certainly piracy has exerted a lot of pressure on the industry to deliver lower prices, more convenient goods, and we can debate whether that's good or bad, but I also believe that it's exerted a downward pressure on prices, and I have data that seem to suggest that when genres experience high piracy or when songs experience higher levels of piracy, it leads to um, companies in the long run pricing them lower. So the data do seem to suggest that's going on. I'm working on that right now, actually. Okay. Any other... Um any other questions? Okay, Robert, one last one before we, um, before we wrap up. And, b and by the way, Brett, I can just tell you that maybe Lamone hasn't uh, responded, but Wikipedia has the whole story and Wikipedia has it accurate. So if it's on Wikipedia, yeah. then... It the must be true, right? <laughs> of course, no one's gone in to see who's made the entry. I added but, that. <laughs> but, 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 but it's there, so it's got to be true. Yeah. So, your books have been reviewed in lots of different places all around the world. New York Times has been reviewed in England, been reviewed elsewhere. Um, so if, if any of you want the short form version, there's lots of reviews and lots of, of interviews. So in Business Week, they have this 
make a quote from you. They say, in Levine's view, the promise of a lightly regulated, copyright averse, free be laden internet has unraveled much in the same way that the late 60s experiments in free love and communal living uh, curdled into the 70s nightmares of hard drugs, broken families, and leaky geodesic domes. That's, a, that's not my quote, Wait that's a paraphrase. <laughs> Oh, I, I didn't. I didn't write that. That's a paraphrase. I thought it was. I thought it was really funny. I, I, you know, I hadn't. I mean, my first reaction was, oh, it's hysterical. It's not a comparison I would make, but I do think there's something. You know, there's a very much a bit of the utopian mindset about the internet. It has always been. You know, I was in San Francisco in the mid '90s. I worked for Hotwired, which, and I started after they sold the first banner ad. This probably seems to many of you like the dawn of time. But um, there was such a lot of utopianism about how things would be free and things would be easy. And that had a very strong libertarian streak. We don't need the government to regulate the internet. You know, um, John Perry Barlow, who was involved in the EFF, even went so far as to say the government has no authority online, which is certainly a rather unique legal interpretation. Um, and I think there is something about that that unraveled. You see that, you know, when the internet attracted a ver rather comparatively small group of kind of techies, they didn't have as much argument with, that, with each other. Now you see many more arguments. Well, you know, every democracy is free speech, but what's free speech in some countries is not considered free speech in others. And you have all these different kinds of norms coming into play and, and I do think that that sort of those utopian notions are collapsing. I mean you see people saying, well, our government's gonna have the authority to regulate. And the answer is, yeah, they're the governments. Like you kind of want to say to these people, and I guess this is where the comparison is smart, get over yourselves. It's the government. And and you know, by the way, that's not a bad thing. I'm not a rabid enthusiast of the U.S. government, but I do vote there, and that gives, you know, I can, if I don't like it, we can throw the bums out. Google and Apple, I, I don't get a vote. So I, I sort of prefer the government exerting some authority to sort of things being left up in the air. It's an unsexy view, I know, but I, I feel a lot more comfortable with it. Okay, any other comments or questions? Uh, if not, on behalf of Osgood community and IP Osgood. I want to thank both of you for, for coming. You know, your schedules were really hectic and people come all the way up north and then have to go back. We know it, it's difficult and to come from Germany is even even more. We know you came for this and at the same time you happen to be doing Canadian Music Week. So we really appreciate it and Osgood appreciates it. Thank you.